lady. Um, she has a PhD in entomology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She's worked as a curator at the Museum of Comparative Anatomy at Harvard University, where she relocated to New Mexico. Wow. <laughs> Glad she's here. And since 1990, she's worked in New Mexico and around the world offering insect identification, non-toxic pest management, and insect and spider surveys. She also lectures um, and does workshops on topics as insects as pollinators, beneficial insects, anthropods of medical importance, biodiversity, and insects, and art. She's also a tutor of the Great Books Program at St. John's College in Santa Fe. <laughs> and for five and a half years, she chronicled anthropods found on the one seed juniper trees in her yard in Santa Fe, finding over 400 different species, including new ones. And uh, her book, Life on Juniper, features her drawings of insects, spiders, and mice, and she has brought books tonight if you're interested in buying some from her. So, Linda, please step forward. Thank you. Thanks so much to the Taos chapter for hosting me, and thank you all for coming. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about how to recognize beneficial insects in your garden and how to attract them to your garden so that they'll be there when you need them. Uh, I want to say before I get started that a lot of these photographs uh, are mine. All of the drawings you'll see are my drawings, but I've also been given permission to use photographs by other people and I couldn't have given this talk without them. Their names are go down here and I want to thank them before I even get started. It's fine, I'll take questions at the end, but it's fine if you have questions while I'm talking, you can just yell them out. And if I can answer them, I will. <coughs> I have to sort of get, figure out how this whole system works first. Let's see. The arrow. <clears throat> there we go. I'm gonna start with a talking about pests that are especially common in the spring, but also all year round, and that is aphids. Here's how you recognize them. They have these two little structures in the back. Those are called cornicles. They're sucking insects. So here's the sucking mouth part. They just put it in your plant and they suck out the juices. Now, one reason that aphids uh, are such a problem is because they have an amazing life cycles. As you can see, this aphid is giving birth to another aphid here, and it's born alive. Wow. So their babies are born alive. For most of the year, the aphids are parthenogenic. That means the females do not have to mate to produce young. So as you can see here, this is a female, she can produce that baby without mating, and that baby is already pregnant with the next generation. So that's one of the, now we're talking, one of the reasons why uh, aphids can uh, reproduce so quickly and why the populations can build up so fast. And let's see, whoop, wrong way. Another reason why aphids are such amazing plant pests is that here's one that has no wings and then some of these have wings. Well, during the season, if the plant that the aphids are on starts to dry up or something happens to it, then they are capable of producing a generation that has wings and those winged ones can fly to other plants and and uh, establish themselves there. So they are really, really adapt uh, easily. Now, ladybugs are famous predators of aphids and actually a lot of other small soft-bodied insects and mites and insect eggs. And pretty much everybody recognizes ladybugs. This is one of our native species here, the seven-spotted ladybug. And um, they can eat a lot of aphids. But they also come in all sorts of varieties. This black one with red spots is in the genus Brachiacantha. I, I don't know what the common name is of that one. This one is only about a millimeter and a half black with white spots. This one's in the genus Hyperaspis. And all of these eat uh, 
a lot of aphids and other small insects. So when you're looking in the stress at your trees or other plants that have all sorts of aphids on them, it's really important to also look and see what kind of beneficial insects are around. Because if you have been a lot of beneficial insects, you don't need to do anything. You'll actually make the situation worse even by spraying with soap solution. So I hope to teach tonight how to recognize all the different stages of the beneficial insects that you might also find when you're looking at your aphids. These are the eggs here. They're usually in small clusters like this, maybe 20 or 30 oval shaped yellowish eggs. Undersides of leaves, very common on trees. You'll also find them on the bark. You'll also find them on your adobe walls and things like that. So learn to recognize those. Wait a minute. What? Sure. Earlier you said they had the um, babies alive and now they're having eggs. They do both. No, this is the ladybugs. Oh, the ladybugs. I'm sorry. sorry. But also, let me just say this. Aphids, in, when the weather starts getting cooler and the... Um, and the days get shorter, then the aphids start producing both males and females, and they'll mate, and they will lay eggs, and it's the aphid eggs will last over the winter. So again, that's another adaptation. It's not till the end of the season where they need to overwinter that the uh, aphids will produce eggs. But these are uh, ladybug eggs. Can uh, aphids lay eggs on the bottom of leaves? Um, aphids lay eggs in all sorts of places. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but for instance, if you have fruit trees or um, pine trees even, you know that in the spring you'll sometimes spray with a dormant oil. Well, one of the main reasons for using dormant oil is to kill the aphid eggs before they hatch and also maybe mite eggs and other kinds of uh, insects that are pests and overwinter on the trees, so. Would it also kill ladybug eggs though? Um, if, but the ladybugs, as we'll talk about very soon, are, aren't going to have eggs on the trees at that time. So uh, timing is sort of everything when you're thinking about insect life cycles and how to control them without using pesticides and things like that. But I'll talk about that in just a moment more. This is the larval stage of that seven-spotted ladybug that I showed you. They look kind of like little dragons, I think they're cool looking animals. And so again, you want to be aware of what these look like because you'll often see them on your plants and they're good. So I've had people call me up because they thought these were damaging their plants when actually they were helping them. This is the pupil stage of the ladybug that the adult will emerge from. You often see these on uh, leaves like this one but you might see them on the bark of the tree. You often see them on walls as well. And they're just attached. Now this fluffy thing here, I wish that was a little clearer picture, is the larval stage of that little uh, black and white ladybug I showed you. And I often see these kinds of larval ladybugs on the pine trees amongst those black aphids. Sometimes you'll see these. And so again, it's not a fungus, it's actually the larval stage of one of the ladybugs. What's that bug right there? The this, this is an aphid. These are aphids. So the eggs would be laid in this case, you know, near aphid colonies and um, mostly when the ladybugs have made it and they're laying eggs, they'll specifically pick places where there's a lot of aphids. So sometimes if you have just a few aphids, the ladybugs don't get that excited about laying their eggs there, but when you have really a lot, then they often will pick those. Um, both the larvae and the adults of the ladybugs uh, are predaceous. Now these are overwintering ladybugs. Well, ladybugs, when the season starts drawing to a close, they'll 
all fly to the tops of mountains to overwintering sites where they'll overwinter all together in giant piles, sort of like you're seeing here. There's a site like this on top of Analia in Santa Fe. And there's literally millions of them. They cover the rocks. They cover the bushes. They're, it's very dramatic to find a ladybug overwintering site. And one thing I do not recommend is that you go to your local nursery and buy ladybugs to control the bugs in your garden. And there's two reasons for that. One, all of those ladybugs that you buy at your nursery are collected at these overwintering sites. People find out where they are and they go up to them with their little pint jars and they fill them with ladybugs and they'll put them in the freezer until the spring and then they'll sell them to you to control you know, bad bugs in your garden. So you're reducing the wild populations if you're buying those insects. But the other reason, maybe even a better reason, is that ladybugs when they overwinter have a layer of fat under their wings and when they wake up from their hibernation they fly until that layer of fat is gone so i don't know how many of you have had the experience of buying ladybugs and put them out and they all fly away <laughs> but that's why because they they've been collected in the wild and stored in the refrigerator but they still have that urge to fly so they fly away you're helping your neighbors they all, your neighbors thank you, but you're not actually getting a, that much benefit from them. If they come to your garden, they're good. And I'll even sometimes go out to some wild area where there's a lot of flowers with aphids and collect the larvae, which can't fly away. So if you put the larvae in your garden, you're good. This is a green lacewing. Uh, probably one of the, the second most famous predator of not only aphids, but a lot of other small insects. And these are wonderful predators. If you have to buy some kind of predator, general predator from a nursery, I would say that these you're going to have better luck with than with ladybugs. So this is what the adult looks like. They, they often come to lights at night. You probably see them, and you might see them uh, in your garden as well. This is the larval stage of the lacewing, and they look a lot like the larval stages of the ladybug that I showed you, but they have these sickle-shaped sickle jaws, which really distinguish them. And some of them actually disguise themselves with little bits of sticks and leaves, and you'll find them crawling amongst your aphid colonies I guess, suppose it camouflaged from the aphids, though I'm not sure that's really true. And here are the eggs. And these, again, when you're looking at your aphids or other plants that are damaged, always look for lacewing eggs. They tend to be in little forests like this. This is on a fennel leaf in my garden. And Every single one of these is going to hatch into a very hungry aphid predator. Now, only the larval stage of the lacewings feed on insects. The adult stages feed on flowers. And I'm going to talk more about this, but it's really important to have a lot of flowering plants around even your vegetable garden because they attract a great variety of beneficial insects. So flowering herbs or any kind of flower, especially if the flowers are small, yarrow, any of the mints are really very, very good for attracting the beneficial insects to your garden. Now, one reason that these eggs are, have this lollipop look to them is that a newly hatched lacewing larva is very happy to eat all their siblings before they're born. But these stalks are just long enough so they can't quite reach them from the stem. And I've seen them, a little tiny lacewing larva standing on its back legs with its front legs up on that stalk trying to reach the egg, but unsuccessful. So they have to go off and find something else to eat. 
Well, let's talk about a few other kinds of maybe less familiar predators of aphids. This is a broadleaf milkweed. It's got those great little orange yellow aphids on it. I, they're a great color. They also are the same kind that go on oleanders. And these white larvae here are the larvae of flower flies or hover flies. You've probably seen these in your garden around flowers. They are bee mimics. And again, the adults visit flowers and are pollinators. So you want them in your garden and they go and they find <coughs> aphid colonies and they lay their eggs in them. And then those larvae I show you eat aphids. That's all they do as they grow up. So good beneficial insect two ways, eat aphids and pollinate. Now here's another kind of fly that's a specialist on aphids. This orange larva here is a predatory midge. And again, let's show you the picture of the adult. Here's what the adults kind of look like mosquitoes, but they're not. Mosquitoes tend to, when they land, have their bodies at a slant like this and midges are more flat which I don't know if that will help you, but maybe. Now this uh, picture is from Planet Natural. There's lots of insectaries that sell these kinds of insects for control of pest insects in your garden. Mostly they work better in greenhouses where it's a more controlled situation, but uh, there's, there's a great variety of these kinds of insects available for purchase, and this is one of them. Okay, so another, probably the, the second most important for actually controlling, getting aphid problems under control are parasitic wasps. So here's this aphid colony. You see these, this one and this one that are hard and darker, sort of brownish. This one is darkening here from the normal green or yellow green color. All of those dark hard ones are parasitized by a little wasp that comes and lays its egg inside. And if you're looking at an aphid colony, look at how many of these, they're called aphid mummies, mummies that you see. If you have just one and thousands of aphids, it's probably not going to be that effective for control. But if you have 15 or 20 percent of them, aphid mummies, leave them alone. Those, they have very quick life cycles. Many of these wasps are also parthenogenic. And so they can really just take care of that problem for you if you just let them be. So always kind of check. Now these little white things that you're, you've probably seen around aphid colonies are the shed skins. So each aphid, here's a, probably that one's about newborn and they'll shed their skin usually around three times before they're adults. <coughs> Here's what the parasitic wasps look like. They're small, they're, they're probably a little bit bigger than the aphids, but they're just a couple millimeters. And you'll often see them flying around uh, your plants. And again, these are good if you, they're good if you don't like aphids. If you like aphids, they're bad. Uh, whenever we talk about aphids, we have to talk about ants which you often see amongst the aphids. And often I'll even find aphid colonies because I see the ants running up and down. Well, remember before when I showed you those cornicles, those two little structures on the back? Well, when the aphids suck sap, but they suck a lot more sap than they can actually digest. And those cornicles put out this very sweet liquid that we call honeydew. The ants love it. So because the ants like it so much, they're very careful to take care, good care of the aphids that produce it for them. So if you drop a ladybug in the midst of an aphid colony, the aphids have something called an alarm pheromone. It's a, a scent that they'll release and it does two things. The aphids nearby 
that animal that was just grabbed by a ladybug will start moving away. Sometimes they'll all jump off the plant, which is amusing to watch. <laughs> but they also warn the ants that there's a, a predator amongst their aphid colony. The ants come running and they'll grab the predator and sometimes they'll kill it or sometimes they'll just throw it off the plant, which is also really amusing to watch. <laughs> the ants will also, and this is to address an earlier question, when the aphids lay eggs in the fall, the ants will often bring those eggs into their nest for the winter and they'll put them back on, on the plants in the spring. <laughs> so, sometimes even though there's lots and lots and lots and lots of beneficial insects around, if the ants are present, they can't get the colonies, the aphids under control. So sometimes just controlling the ants will allow everything else just to take place, the beneficials to get the upper hand. And that's not always easy to do, but for instance, if you put a sticky band around trees that have aphid problems and ants going up and down just enough to prevent the ants from moving to the aphid colonies, then the beneficial insects can move in and control the aphids. It's important that there's no other access besides the trunk for that to work. If there's all other places the ants can get on, they'll use other roots. But I've had that work very effectively. That's an ant that I, am <laughs> taking away a green lacewing that was amongst it, laying eggs in its avid colony. All right, so I'm going to move on to another class of uh, pests in the garden, and that's caterpillar pests. These are parsley worms on some of my fennel. They're also called black swallowtails. And these, they're really cute when they're little, and they don't seem like they're doing that much damage to your plant. But once they get this big, you come out one day and your plants are total nubs and they've eaten everything. <laughs> one reason for that is that right before the caterpillar pupates, makes its cocoon, those last day or two, it will actually eat as much as it ate the entire rest of its life. So you might not realize that there's a problem or that even that the insects are present and then all of a sudden everything is gone. That's the black swallowtail. I really like those butterflies, so I tend to just plant more dill or fennel or whatever if I have them so everybody can share. But if you're growing it as a crop, you don't probably want to do that. You, I'm sure you recognize this is a tobacco hornworm. It's on a, this is Santa Domingo tobacco in my, a, this is a tobacco hornworm. Tobacco hornworm. There's a tomato hornworm, very much like it. Also eats your tomato plants, and if you grow tobacco, um, it will eat that too. They look very similar, except that tomato hornworm has a little white V, where these have little white, have those white slashes. They're really, really cute. Again, when they're little, they're, they look like uh, little walking pins when they're just hatched. Here's the egg. You'll find them underneath the leaves. And here's its horn. But if you've ever battled tomato hornworms or tobacco hornworms, you know that they can really do a lot of damage very fast. But fortunately, there's also lots of predators. This is the adult. These come to light. So if you have a light on and you have a lot of these at the light, you know that they're mating and that they're soon going to be eggs. And then soon after that, there will be caterpillars. So you can start watching out for them. This is a paper wasp. Again, you can see it's at a flower. They are important pollinators. They visit flowers as adults, even though they feed their babies on caterpillars. So here's another case where having a lot of flowering plants around in a vegetable garden can help attract the predators that you want. This is one of their nests. You probably recognize them. They're under the eaves of your house. 
lots, the empty cells, the ones like this one and this one will have larvae in them. And so the adults ha hunt caterpillars and bring them back and they kind of chew them up and they feed them to the larvae. The ones with the caps are already pupated and they'll come out as adults. And because these colonies can get kind of big, they can really control a caterpillar problem, all, all sorts of caterpillar problems. They'll, con they'll control cabbage butterflies and lots of other, if you can tolerate them. So I'm trying to do a plea for toleration of these wasps, which are, I mean, you, if you throw rocks at them, they'll come sting you, but mostly they're not that aggressive and they're really beneficial both as pollinators and as pest control. And here's another kind of hunting wasp that, uh, feed on their larvae on caterpillars. It's called a thread waste wasp. You can see this. And uh, again, they have feed on flowers as adults, so you need flowers around. And this kind of wasp digs holes in the ground like this one is doing. And they put a caterpillar in the hole, they lay an egg on top of it, and then they cover up the hole. And the young wasp larva will eat that caterpillar and then come out and find some more caterpillars. Now, caterpillars also suffer from parasites, just like those aphids that I showed you. This is the caterpillar. It's another hornworm. Here's its horn. These are the ones of the white line sphinx moth. They eat a lot of the native flowers. They eat the evening primroses. They eat gora. They eat the four o'clock. A lot of different native plants, but what I wanted to show you were these two white spots here. Those are the eggs of a wasp, and they will get inside that caterpillar, and the, the caterpillar will still make a cocoon, but instead of getting a moth out of it, if you raise it out, you'll just get a bunch of wasps. And sometimes, Almost every cocoon I raise out, you get wasps instead of caterpillars. It's one of the reasons that made it really hard for very early entomologists to figure out the life cycles of, um, of some of the butterfly and moth species, because sometimes you would get butterflies and moths, and sometimes you'd get wasps, and that didn't really make a lot of sense. Now, this is a hornworm. Again, this is a tobacco hornworm, and you see these little fluffy, these are cocoons on it. These are the cocoons of a parasitic wasp. This caterpillar isn't going to eat anything anymore, and every single one of these cocoons, cocoons will hatch out a parasitic wasp. They'll go out and find more hornworms to parasitize. So if you ever see this in your garden, you just want to leave that caterpillar where it is and let the beneficial insects sort of just do their thing. And if you find one in your friend's garden, you want to take it home and put it in. <laughs> <laughs> now there's lots and lots of kinds of parasitic wasps. There's egg parasites, there's uh, caterpillar pa parasites, there's cocoon parasites, there, and this is another uh, ichneumon wasp. They come to lights, where, which is where I took this photograph. And this is really long antennae like this, and this sort of long abdomen. And so all of these are beneficial insects for your garden. And they also feed on flowers as adults. So you want to have a lot of flowering plants around. And here's another this one's a teensy one that I found on one of my trees. And this is, this species actually a hyperparasite. So you remember the aphid mummy with the little parasite inside it? Well, this one will come along and lay its egg inside the wasp parasite inside the aphid. So they, they kind of go up a bunch of layers. So I guess you could call this a, a non-beneficial insect because it's actually parasitizing the beneficial insects. So there's a lot of drama going on in your garden all the time if you just take the time to look for it. 
And one of the good things I think about being an entomologist is I really like my vegetables and my flowers, but if the bugs come and get it, I'm sort of fascinated with that too. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. Let's talk about a few other kinds of uh, predators that you might see. This is a praying mantis. People are familiar with that. She's laying eggs. This is what her, this will darken, but that's what her egg sac looks like. And you sometimes will find these on stems. Sometimes you'll find them on your wall. And each of these little long sections here is a praying mantis. Uh, baby waiting to be born. Uh, everybody knows that they're beneficial, but they're not, they're fun to have, but they're actually not going to get uh, any kind of serious pest problems under control. You never get enough of them in your garden. They're happy to eat each other. So if you get a bunch of, you maybe 20 babies, you might get two adults in a garden. So they're, they're still, I would still say they're good insects to have around, but they're never actually abundant enough to solve a grasshopper problem or, or anything like that. Now this is the nymph or immature form of an assassin bug. You can, yeah, you can see it has this evil looking mouth part here. They pierce insects with it and suck out their insides. I know. <laughs> And this is the adult of that. Uh, ew. 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 Well, they're related to stink bugs. They're in the same family. Not, they're, I mean, in the same order. It's, the order is called true bugs. Co colloquially, almost any creepy crawly is called a bug. But there's one particular group of insects that's called true bugs. And, uh, and this is one of them, the, the hemiptera. And you can see it has this these are native around here. You might see them in your garden. It has this cog structure here. It has the evil looking mouth part again. And even though everybody is afraid of brown recluse spiders and getting bitten by them, and there's never been one in Taos, not, not even one has ever been found. When I actually get calls from the emergency room and people have the actual insect that bit them, it tends to be one from this group of assassin bugs. They, they're not really dangerous, they just hurt so much. I had a friend tell me that you get bit by one of these and that you'll be praying for death. It hurts so much, but, but you'll be fine. It just hurts. <laughs> <laughs> you, they don't, they, no, you won't die, it just hurts. But now you know, so don't pick them up. And here's some other, these are, are pretty common. Uh, insects in that same family of the true bugs that are uh, uh, also assassin bugs. These are called ambush bugs. They often are on flowers and they just sort of wait being really still. This one, here's the male is on top. They're mating and the female over here. Uh, and this one, they were waiting at the flower and the, the female, they're mating, a, this is uh, the male on top, the female on the bottom, the female is feeding on this bee she just caught. <laughs> so they don't, they don't always catch uh, pest insects. But they're pretty vicious predators. She's not too interested in the bee. No, she's interested in eating that bee more than she's interested in that male. But you'll see these on flowers. They're common on daisies and all sorts of uh, composite flowers. Let's talk a little about spiders. So spiders actually can be important predators in the garden for actually controlling pests. And there's lots of, one of the reasons is because there's lots of different kinds. And some are active in the day and some are active at night and some hunt on plants and some hunt on the ground. So th and there can, you can get pretty good populations of spiders and they're all good. This is a jumping spider. You find them on the leaves of plants during the day. This is one of the here cobweb spiders. Here it's eating a carpenter ant. But this is one of the most common spiders at my house. I find that any time I go out and look, I'm finding this spider. And they eat a big variety of insects. They make 
they're related to the black widows, but they're not poisonous, but they make kind of messy webs like black widows make. This is one of our native wolf spiders. So they're active night hunters on the ground. And this is probably, you've seen these are called variously pumpkin spiders or barn spiders or cat face spiders. And she's built a big web on one of my plants. And here she is eating a fly. So spider egg sacs, you should learn to recognize. They all spiders uh, in some way lay their eggs inside a big ball of silk. This one is the egg sac of one of those barn spiders. And inside is about, oh, maybe 300 or 400 eggs. And they're going to all hatch, like this one did, <laughs> into lots of little spiderlings. And some of these will establish in your garden. And the little ones eat little bugs. And as they grow bigger and bigger, they eat bigger and bigger bugs. And then other ones will put out a little strand of silk and float away on the wind, just like you saw in Charlotte's Web, if you ever watched that. It's called ballooning. So how can you encourage, let's talk a little bit, uh, besides flowering plants, about how to encourage beneficial insects in your garden. Well, one way, this is a moss rock wall, and you can see it's got all these little nooks and crannies. Well, spiders use those nooks and crannies. A lot of the hunting wasps that hunt caterpillars and crickets and other insects use those nooks and crannies. So, so providing insects right in your garden or very close to it with these little niches is one very important way that you can increase the predator population near your garden. Also, many, many insects are active at night and Spiders, for instance, are active hunting at night, but during the day, they need a dark, cool place to relax. And uh, if you have a lot of mulch that in your garden, that means the spiders and some other predatory beetles in particular will use that mulch as a great place to spend the day. And then when they come out at night to hunt, they're right in your garden. So those two things, well, three things, a lot of flowering plants, especially with small flowers, mulch, and something with a lot of little nooks in it will all do a lot to increase the beneficial insect population in your garden. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about pollinators. They're another thing that you want in your garden. This is a honeybee, and honeybees have been, oops, excuse me, let me go back. <clears throat> there we go. Have been much in the news because their populations are going down and they're in trouble for a variety of reasons. And uh, so anything you can do to encourage your honeybees is good. And one of the best things you can do is have a lot of flowering plants around throughout the year that they visit. This is a hive that was right near our vegetable garden. Unfortunately, it died out, but it made such a huge difference in the amount of production of vegetables we got in our garden that uh, it was invaluable to have a hive of bees nearby. So if you can, again, anything we can do to encourage bees by giving them a place to live and by giving them flowers to feed on is important. And there's also lots and lots of different kinds of native bees. And one thing about honeybees is that there's so many of them in a hive and they, they're, so, they're pretty aggressive in gathering nectar and pollen that they'll often outcompete the native bees. So I've noticed uh, in my yard that in years where honeybee populations are low, native bee populations tend to be higher. And you can get a whole variety of them. So again, these are squash bees here. And for whatever reason, they sometimes just rest on flowers all night. And that's what these were doing that I, when I photographed them. But you'll often, if you have uh, squash plants, if you go out in the early morning, these are the ones that you'll find way down inside the flower. 
This is a leaf cutter bee. They're actually quite common. They, they look a lot like honeybees, but they're a little bit bigger and a little bit different coloration. If you've ever seen this, this is a rose leaf with all these perfect kind of holes cut out of it. That's not a caterpillar. Those are leaf gutter bees cutting your leaves. And the per, sort of the perfection of the cuts is what tells you that it's a leaf gutter bee and not a uh, grasshopper or a caterpillar or something like that. So they use these leaves to line their nests. And if you see this, instead of being mad, you could try being happy that you have pollinators, native pollinators, right nearby your garden. And in the normal wild situation, these bees will nest in these old beetle holes that are, this is a juniper tree. They find these little holes and that's where they make their nests. They line them with those leaf pieces and they stock the nest with pollen and nectar and lay their eggs on that and then put a leaf partition and do that again. So there could be three or four of them in one of these old beetle holes. One thing that is being much encouraged lately is to give native bees habitat. And this is, you can just take a bunch of soda straws and put them in a can and hang them in a tree and they'll colonize it. And you'll see uh, here, this one, this one, and this one, those are little leaf circles in the top of them. This one that looks more like clay is clay. There's an, other kinds of bees called mason bees that also use this kind of habitat. You'll also get a lot of the hunting wasps will use this kind of habitat. So I've done this just hanging up a can with some soda straws or pieces of pithy plant in them. I've also just taken an old stump and every single size of drill bit that I have and just drilling all kinds of holes in it, put it out in the garden. You'll get all sorts of things colonizing it. So this is a way to encourage not only our native bees and to give them habitat right near your garden, but also you'll get some of the hunting wasps using these holes as well. Can you use plastic, plastic straws? Yeah, I've used plastic straws. I, it's, I, it's really, so I'll take a regular like bean can and put some glue in the bottom, put some plastic straws in, and kind of cut them off at the level of the can and just hang them up in a tree or sometimes just from the eaves of the house. And they won't, this is not uh, my picture, but they won't all get filled, but 50% you know, of them will often be colonized because that's often limiting. It's not even the flowers, the, the nectar, that's limiting for these bees, but correct nesting spots are limiting. Do you, do you hang them straight up like this way? Yeah, I just hang them. I just hang them. Sometimes I'll hang them from a tree, so from a branch in a tree, and sometimes I'll just hang them from the porch of the house. It's horizontal. It's horizontal like that, with the, the straw heads, just like you see them there. So um, this is a really kind of simple, easy way to encourage native pollinators. I just go as deep as they go. I'm, not, I'm sure that some people have been more scientific, but really I've just taken an old stump, drilled all kinds of holes all around it of all different sizes, just as pretty much as deep as they go and put it out in the middle of the garden. And always, not all of them get colonized, but always a bunch of them do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've also taken a, a big branch and done that and hung it, for instance, from the limbs of a fruit tree. And you'll get slightly different kinds of bees utilizing the nest, depending upon whether the stump is on the ground or up in the tree. But that's, it's just really easy to do. And I don't think I've ever done it and got nothing coming in. Bumblebees are also important pollinators. They're better pollinators of, for instance, um, tomato and pepper and eggplant than the honeybees are. And they're better pollinators of a lot of the bean and pea type plants as well. They normally live in old 
mouse holes and things in the ground. If you have an irrigation box, they might move into that as well. They, um, they do sell bumblebee nesting boxes. I've never tried it, so if anybody ever has, I'd be interested to know if they actually came and colonized it. But they're, they're for sale. And again, our bumblebee diversity has been going down lately, too, for unknown reasons. This is a, a, what's called a sweat bee. You've probably seen them on flowers, green iridescent bees, very sort of small, maybe three or four millimeters. And these nest in the ground. So they, they just dig holes in the ground and they stock it with pollen and they lay their eggs on it and they cover them up. So actually having some hard bare ground around your garden area somewhere not too far away will encourage not only this kind of bee, the sweat bees, but a couple of other different kind of ground nesting bees, which most people don't even know. I know I was helping a friend entomologist once dig up a bunch of ground nesting bees because he was studying them. And this, the rancher came by and asked what we were doing with, well, we're digging up bees. And he was <laughs> skeptical that we knew what we were talking about because bees live in trees, they don't live in holes in the ground. He came back about six hours later, we're still doing it. He's like, well, they're serious about it anyway, even though they have no idea what they're talking about. So again, some, some hard, hard ground, even sort of waste areas can be really valuable for native pollinators. I want to talk just a little bit about how we assess whether given insects are pests or not. Because many times I'll get asked, so oh, is this a bad bug or is this a good bug? And it's not always that simple. So I want to talk, this is, oops, excuse me, talk about uh, harvester ant nests, which here's the typical cone nest that we see. And you know, they, these ants clear a big, big area around the nest. Obviously, if it's right in your garden, you're mad because they kill all the plants nearby. And they also have a really nasty bite. So if you have these nests in a children's playground, you really can't just leave it there. They, it, they could be serious even as a medical problem. You have to get rid of them. But they're not called harvester ants for nothing. They're called harvester ants because they spend all their time collecting seeds. So if you have one of these nests just sort of a little bit away from your flower garden or vegetable garden and not somewhere where you have to walk, they spend all day, every day collecting weed seeds from your garden and bringing them to your nest. And in that case, I would say these are highly beneficial animals and not really pests. So again, it's worth thinking about uh, in a given situation, whether an insect is a pest insect or actually might be doing you a lot of good if you just sort of sit and watch what they're actually doing every day in your garden. Because some ants, as I showed you before, are taking care of the aphids and making sure they're okay, and those you would classify as pests. But those same ants earlier in the season are predators. And if you watch at their nest, they're bringing in all kinds of stuff, crickets, grasshoppers, caterpillars. So early in the season, they're actually being pretty helpful. Later on, when, the, when they start tending the aphids, they're much more of a problem. And just one more example like this. This is me. I'm helping a friend of mine, a Hopi friend out at the reservation harvest her corn. And what the Hopis do is when in the spring, they dig down in the ground, find out where the water layer is, and then they put four corn seeds in a hole and cover it up. And you can see these are in clumps here. And this is what they say. Well, there's one for the grasshoppers, one for the crows, one for the lizards, and one for us. And then they never control the insects. They, they just try, they plant enough for everybody. They do, they do sometimes hoe weeds, but I've never seen them concern themselves at all with the insects on the corn. They just, this is their philosophy. And when you're shucking the corn, the, the res dogs kind of come and sit around and they wait for you to find the caterpillars and 
throw them to the dogs and they eat them. And then they just store the corn. They don't even worry about it. And that's the end of the main part of the talk. This is a plate from a book that's in the back. My partner Steve is back there with them called The Theater of Insects. It's an art book that I did with a local Santa Fe photographer on insects, and it's a beautiful book. Also, uh, there's a copy or two of another book, this one, which is much more academic book, looking at uh, the role of science and the kinds of claims that scientists make about what they know and maybe what they really know. And then this one. So here's my email address. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. There's also some cards of mine in the back, as well as uh, one of my field notebooks is there if you just want to look. I spend a lot of time just in the field drawing plants and insects, and I've done a lot of work on biodiversity, and most of that is recorded in my field notebook. And that's all. I'm happy to take questions. You said there.